Welcome to the latest episode of Lateral Think, brought to you by Melbourne Athletic Development. Melbourne Athletic Development is a sports and injury management clinic based in Melbourne, Australia. To maximise your performance, optimise your injury management, contact the team at Melbourne Athletic Development. As many of you know, Jack and I have a very diverse understanding across multiple areas of practice, whether they relate to sports performance, say for instance with my background in track coaching, or with Jack and his background in yoga practice. We've combined a lot of this knowledge over time with our clinical and sports performance experiences to really develop what we do. And as you know, we love education. So what we've tried to do is take that knowledge and put it into an online learning community. We think this is important because it's an opportunity for people to interact, learn, and upskill as they try to improve the practice of what they do. So if this is something that you would be interested in doing, head to melbourneathleticdevelopment.com.au forward slash education and get an understanding of how you can upskill your current practice. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Melbourne Athletic Development Podcast. We are very lucky today to be joined by Dr. Julia Kirby, orthopedic surgeon. Julia, do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, great. Thanks a lot for having me on today. Um, So yeah, as uh, I was just introduced, um, my name is Julia. I'm an orthopedic surgeon who has an interest in um, paediatric and adolescent sports injuries, particularly around the knee. Um, I have done a fellowship overseas in Texas, which was primarily ped sports. So I'm really interested in joint preservation and dealing with youth athletes with open growth plates. Yeah, fantastic. What what drew you to going to the US? Was it something about the specific sort of surgical environment in America or were you looking for an experience? Obviously, I know that a lot of, we had a number of surgeons on and it's really obviously a big thing. People do fellowships overseas. They feel like it kind of broadens their experience. But was there something specific about the US that that drew you there? Yeah, there definitely. I think... Um Obviously, their population alone is huge. Mm. So the volume of cases and the exposure that you get over there is amazing. Um, What do you see a lot more of that you'd say, you know, is rare here that it's like in there because of the population, it's like we see those quite often. Yeah, so a couple of more congenital things like discoid meniscus, for example, um, that was extremely prevalent, particularly in Texas because like we see it in the Asian population here in Australia, um, it's got a higher incidence in the Hispanic population as well, um, which was quite interesting. Um, And then just other things that are considered generally rare, things like tibial spine fractures, um, osteochondritis desiccans, um, other cartilage lesions. So just the volume is greater and therefore, I was sort of getting exposed to that That's so good. weekly, which is yeah. awesome. And do you um, feel like that has sort of separated you a little bit from some of your peers in the fact that like now you come back and you're like, oh, I've done a million of these. Well, not a million, but I've done <laughs> I, a lot of these ones. I definitely could tell you it's not a million, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but for sure. I think um, – it's given me a really unique perspective um, and I feel very privileged to have had that experience. Um, it's really helped me to sort of shape my practice the way I want it to be. So I'm, I'm really primarily interested in seeing the youth population um, and it enables me to feel more confident with managing those rare conditions because, um, you know, experience is everything, yeah. I think. And you can't, unfortunately, <laughs> you can't buy experience. Can exactly. You? you need to actually exactly. go through it. And you can read about it all you want, but until you physically see it and operate on it you know every case is slightly different so So two questions out of that one (laughs) I'll ask you about like pediatrics in a second and why pediatrics but the second one is like what is it um it it seems more rare and maybe I'm completely wrong because I don't speak to that many surgeons but it seems more rare for people to go to the US than in Australia people tend to go to the UK quite a bit what's is there something with that and is it Uh, difficult to get a position in a fellowship in the US yeah that that, that's exactly what it is um so there's a couple of issues with going to the US you have to sit their medical school exams yeah okay um so so people don't want to do that oh and it's to be completely frank it's 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 a lot um so is it hard or is it it's It's purely hard because when I was sitting them, I was over 10 years out of medical school and Mm. the content is all basic science from medical school. Mm. So it's physiology, but it's also like um, renal physiology and things that I haven't covered in a long time. Mm. You know, I know that some basics and I know how it affects my patients, but I don't know the intricacies of that at that level. Um, I I always think about (laughs) this in terms of like, I've got a very close mate. He's a lawyer and he he works in, in the US. So we had to sit 
the, the bar exam in New York and he's done it in LA now, I think. He might have even done it in Texas. <laughs> wow. And um, it's always funny. I talk to him about, and he's, he's got an enormous ego, as I'm sure you can expect from a lawyer, but he's always banging on about how our education in Australia is like much higher than what he expected. Mm -hmm. So he said dealing with American lawyers, he's like, they're all, like not all of them. He said, unless they went to like one of the really, really top schools like Harvard, he's like, they're not actually that good. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's a law specific thing, but do you see, uh, and not not to say that one's better than the other, but do you see a difference in the way that we're trained here compared to say the US? Yeah, I think there's definitely a difference um, and it's very regional. I think most people would say that there's a slight difference between Canada and the US, US and UK, UK and Australia. I think we're very lucky here. Our training as um, registrars through the program is very hands-on. Mm. So, um, you know, we get the ability to operate early um, and you get to grow that confidence as you're going through the training program whereas the system in the US is different it's much more academic early on okay. um, and the surgical skills side of things comes later in your training so fellowship years um, which is not necessarily a bad thing it's just very it's different, different yeah. um, and I guess they also start going into orthopedics and subspecialty training straight out of medical school whereas here it would be a typical trajectory of about five years after med school to get into orthopedics. Was that daunting for you? Um, having to know, like, no, I've got another five years before I'm even going to start. After this. med school? Yeah. No, I think, and, I, and this is where I think it's actually beneficial. Yes, you're a bit older when you finish the program, but I think it makes you more well-rounded. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and it also allows those people who maybe aren't, you know, really sure to have a bit more of a feel for the profession. And those who think they're sure can have a feel for orthopedics and then go, actually, it's not for me. Yeah. Um, so I actually, I think it's actually a good thing, um, even though timeline wise, it does put you a little bit older. I was probably five years older than most of the US fellows, but that's okay. Life yeah. experience. Yeah, <laughs> something you see though, like even um, for us with uh, physios we employ here, some of them have done stuff before they study physiotherapy as yeah. opposed to going straight from school to physio and you notice a big difference just from those life yeah. experiences as well too and therefore I think what you learn mm -hmm. at uni and then even the simple things of like how you actually interact with people too. Absolutely. Yeah, which... I think you very often dismiss those things of thinking like they're soft things and not that important, but actually <laughs> I think the older you get, the more you realise how significant those things are. Definitely. I yeah. think they're hugely important, particularly in our professions. Mm. Like we're interacting with people on a daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. The communication I think is key, mm. particularly with managing a lot of these conditions. Um, so, Well, you, you can decide this. I was going to ask about that. Do you want to speak about the paediatric side or do you want to talk about managing that? Because I feel like surgeons generally right, and orthopedic surgeons have a bad rap mm -hmm. of not having the greatest bedside manner. And I think, you know, we spoke about this before because we've had one of your colleagues and, and one of our friends, Pam Bokel, on about I think the really nice thing of seeing a lot more female orthopedic surgeons coming into the profession and it's really changing that interaction because... Most women, I, I feel their communication's a hell of a lot better than some of the men, yeah. right? And that's actually a lot nicer, even for us as a physio yeah. going back and forth, having communication seems to be a lot more open and a lot less of like, I'm up here, you're down there. Absolutely. Um, which isn't, has been nice. I was going to say, you might be able to correct me in this, but isn't the statistic now that if you look at the amount of um, females going into medicine and studying it's it's larger than males now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think it's been like that in for medicine, a while. In medicine, been, but sorry. Yeah. Not surgery. Surgery is But not different. surgery. Yes. Surgery yeah. is still quite low, mm. um, but it is increasing um, as, I think, interest increases, but also support. Mm. Um, and just and I think it's support at that, those sort of junior years that are important. Mm. I think once you're on the training program, we're all trainees, you know, we just get on with it to a degree mm. um, but I think it is that early support that's important so we have seen that change and I do agree I think in one you know one side of things yes it could be the female thing but also I think it is a bit of a change in Changing the generation the guard. yeah, yeah. Um, you know people do realize it is important to speak to your patients <laughs> and to <laughs> spend that time um, and and it really makes the patient experience better as well yeah um, so I do I do try and do that to the best of my ability yeah it's one of those things that, you know, speaking with Pam, I think she mentioned that it might have been last year. I can't remember exactly when. It would have been last year when we had her yeah, on. We had, well, but yeah, she was saying yeah. that I think the latest intake into the orthopedic program, I think it was 40% female mm -hmm. uh, for 
was it Vic- Victoria that she was seeing? I can't remember. Anyway, yeah. yeah, but it's kind of nice to see that like that's evening out because it seems to have been a very male dominated kind of yeah. surgical specialization. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that is? Like, why do you think that you're not seeing the even though there's uh, more and more females doing medicine, but less going into surgery? I think there's a lot of factors there. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, very long-held ideas about, um, you know, the physicality of surgery. Mm. Um, It is a physical job, Mm. but it's not necessarily about being, like, you know, having brute strength. It's about having endurance and technique um, and and different elements of, you know, physical uh, sort of fitness. Um, Mm. I also think that the time, like being a surgical registrar, it's hard. You have to work long hours. And if you want to have a family, I Mm. think, you know, like anyone in society, the onus does fall on to the mother a lot of the time to be the caregiver. Um, So that can be a challenge. But I think the program's becoming more flexible and promoting flexible training, which I think will really help that going forward. Yeah, I feel like some of those, you know, more traditional and older professions like law, like medicine, for too long have had this idea of like, we did it so you have to, like you have to yeah. follow it, like you have to suffer because we did. Yeah. You know, speaking and with a couple of patients that we've had here of, who work in, you know, public hospital, as you said, as, as a registrar, they're getting smashed. And it's like, really, in today's day and age, like, is that what we want to promote? Like almost unsafe workplace behaviour? It's, yeah. it's like... You haven't slept. Why are you making medical decisions? Yeah, and I think a lot of that is unconscious bias. I must say, like, as far as, like, I even find myself falling into that trap going, oh, you know, I would easily work those those hours when I was that level. And it's like, no, that that's not honor. okay. You yeah, know, like, yeah. just because I can do it doesn't mean that it's necessarily okay. So yeah. I think, you know, there's a lot more education now around safe working hours, and I think, you know, we can only see improvements yeah. in that facet. All right, why children? Why children? <laughs> Excellent question. I think um, it's been a bit of an evolving process for me. So I originally, yes, wanted to do orthopaedics, wasn't really sure what facet would suit me. Um, and then as I got more experience with arthroscopy, I was like, yep, it's going to be sports. I really like the technical challenges. And then, <laughs> and then I was thinking... I'll make it harder by making everything miniature. Everything a little bit smaller. <laughs> <laughs> and fragile. And fragile and have some growth plates involved. Um, look, I like the challenge. Yep. Um, and I also just like the fact that kids are amazing. They will... Mostly, they get better. Yeah, they're, right? ro- they're robust. They're really robust. And um, the adaptability yeah. is so high, isn't it? And I just love the, the, you know, working with a kid to get them back into sports because I think one of the things that we see, like in the adult population, you often have adults are sort of auto-selecting out of sport or they're, you know, they're open to that discussion, whereas I'm a big advocate of keeping kids in sport. I think it's really important. Mm. Um, You know, I think historically with certain conditions, we would say, I'm sorry, you've got this really frustrating condition, you can't play sport for four years. I just feel like that's not acceptable. No, Um, I I agree with you. I have this discussion with people all the time because, rightly or wrongly, I feel like often I'm looking for ways to keep people going in whatever level of activity they can do rather than pulling the ripcord on them and saying, like, no, you need actual rest now and only rehab, Mm -hmm. right? Like, as someone who was an athlete who had injuries, someone saying to you, like, you can't do what you like doing and you're just going to do rehab – to me, it's very frustrating. Um, and so I kind of early on committed as like, okay, even if they can't say maybe run, but they like, I'll get them on the bike. They can work yeah. hard on that. They can do this. Because as you said, you're sort of taking them out of something. And that's, I don't know that that's actually, and it'd be interesting to see because you're at a level, I think, above our decision making at times. Um, but I actually don't think that that's always our decision to make. Yeah. Yet we seem to think that it is yeah. in healthcare. Um, I, I, I agree. I think um, for me, I, I think there's always going to be conditions that the kid does have to slow down. Yeah. But I agree with you. Like if they can't run, we should get them on the bike or we should get them walking in the pool or something like that. You know, something that keeps them active. You know, if they have rehab exercises, they should stay with their team and they should be yeah. doing their rehab exercise on the sidelines so that they're still part of that team mentality. Because um, I think that, and I think we saw this through COVID, um, not playing team sports has a huge impact on kids' mental health. Yeah, the isolation is not massive. valuable. Yeah. Um, and they're in a really vulnerable time in their life. So I, I often tell the kid, I'm like, look, I'm, I'm your knee consultant. 
I'm not your life consultant. So, like, what I say is about your knee health, but at the same time I'm willing to work with you because we need to, you know, make sure your life is good too. Mm. Um, and, yeah, so I, I'm a big advocate for trying to keep kids in sport and – I think that's another reason I got into it was because, like, coming up with ways of, you know, managing these conditions in a population that have trouble activity modifying. It is a challenge <laughs> and it's sometimes a challenge you don't win, but I think on the whole it's very rewarding. How do you, as someone, I guess, you know, you're still earlier into your specialisation, yeah. how, do, how do you deal with that? You know, like, when you give recommendations to people and you know they're not following them. Yeah. Um, it, have you reached the point where you're managing that in a way that you're comfortable with or are you still kind of wrestling with that? Because I think that's something that even, you know, Jack and I are similar sort of 10, 12 years in and, and you're probably the same in terms of um, even medical but maybe not with your surgical yeah. practice. Um, I feel like it's always a challenge. Oh, it's it's absolutely a challenge. I think the key, and I think we just touched on this earlier, is communication, right? Uh, the, the best thing I can do is continuously communicate with the whole care team. So I'm big on my team um, where I work at Orthospot, always including like the physiotherapist, any other adjunct health professionals in the care team so that my correspondence always goes out. Mm. That way, like, you know, and I tell the patient, I said, I want to communicate with everyone because I want to make sure we get you the best outcome and this is the best way to do it. And I think at, they're not always going to follow your instruction. And you do have elements in the community where you do have a clash between health professionals as well or who perhaps have different perspectives. So I do have an example. I'm a little bit more progressive with the way I manage like osteochondritis desiccans um, in the sense that I don't keep them non-weight-bearing for a really long time. Um, if their pain settles, they can weight-bear, they can ride a bike, things like that. Um, and that's a lot of stuff I picked up overseas, but I had a situation where I got referred a young kid, really active kid. I said to him, okay, you can walk, you can ride your bike, you can do this, but you can't, you know, play footy and cricket. I'm sorry. Like, you, we've got to pull it back a bit. We've got to get this to heal. And then <laughs> I got told by the family that they'd gone and seen a physiotherapist who's extremely experienced, which was absolutely great, and I wanted them to see someone and they'd said, oh, I can't believe you're not on crutches, get on crutches, do this. And so the, the way I managed that, though, was I just called the physio and said, hey, I just want to chat to you about, like, my philosophy versus your philosophy. Let's have a, you know, discussion. And I'm going to send you some information that I use, um, you know, all the, the, the stuff that I give patients and that kind of stuff. And then about three months later, he referred me a patient with OCD and said, I've already given them all your patient handouts. And I was like, fantastic. Like, here we are working together. And mm. a lot of it is not at all. We're both looking at the safety of the patient, right? And crutches is a conservative but very safe way to manage OCD. Um, and I think, yeah, it was, it was a great sort of outcome there that we just had a discussion. And I, and I was like, yep, I understand why you put the kid on crutches at that point. They had a bit more pain. So I think we just got to work together. Mm. Um, and keep those lines of communication open. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, I think that's the big thing, though, too, is you actually going out of your way to contact that person yeah. because I think that's the thing that often gets missed. Yeah. Um, I think the problem then, too, is is if you have a patient that you know is seeing someone else, Yeah. there's certain assumptions made about what they, they are or, or not doing based on what the patient says, yeah. which is often not the uh, <laughs> best way to determine not if that's actually trip. accurate or not. Yeah. In, in terms of dealing with paediatric populations, what do you think is unique about that from a surgical perspective? Other than, you know, we said things are smaller and, and healing may be different. Like, how do you... Do you have some sort of overview that you see of, okay, like, I need to approach this differently or do you approach it very similarly? I think that I definitely have a slightly different approach. I try and keep a lot of my things consistent just for continuity but at the same time you have to tailor your treatment to the patient um, and the way I see it is that the biggest challenge is really the growth plate situation for kids mm. um, and that can be a real asset and a real problem so in like some conditions it can be a real asset because we can guide the growth we can change the limb alignment much easier than you can once someone's finished growing mm. but then also when you're dealing with like let's say a 10 year old who's got an ACL tear that's still having instability or tearing their meniscus then we've got to think about what's the best option for them surgically and how can I do this safely so that they can finish the remainder of potentially six years of growth if it's a boy um and you know reach their full potential so I think you have to it's a little bit more I guess all of orthopedics is very case-based 
And in some ways we've got this sort of, um, you know, algorithm, but at the same time every patient's slightly unique yeah. in their own way. Um, and I would say also the challenge um, is that you're not just seeing a patient when you're seeing a child, you're seeing a patient and their parents. Yeah. Um, and so you've got more, you know, a more, of a challenge, more stakeholders, it? right? It's yeah. not just someone saying this is my livelihood. It's like, well, this is my child and clearly they're going to be, you know, ultimately extremely stressed about what's going on and the prospect of big surgery in a young child. Um, so, yeah, I think there are challenges. <laughs> but You mentioned ACL before and we actually were lucky enough to have Stephanie Philbay on um, to discuss, you know, non-surgical management. Is it something that they're looking at in paediatric populations as well? Yeah, look, I think... So I guess I have a fairly... Um, I have a fairly clear philosophy on ACLs I I don't you know I think that there's a lot of stuff coming out about ACLs healing and I don't think we're we're not going to get into that today because I would say that why not well I I would say tell us your philosophy so my my philosophy is it probably doesn't heal what do you think happens well I think that it scars Mm. and often what we see surgically when patients come two three years down the track after having an ACL tear is it can look not too bad on the MRI, mm. um, particularly if it's scarred to PCL. Um, but then, and on the sagittal of the MRI, you can see that, oh, the ACL's running, the fibres look like they're running in a relatively okay orientation, but they've got some rotational instability. They might even have a reasonable Lockman, a bit of asymmetry, and that's because when it scars to PCL, you get some AP control, but you mm. don't get the rotational control. Mm. So I think what happens is that often happens and the patient compensates yeah. and they feel okay and then they have another small event and maybe you know they tear their medial meniscus, they lose their secondary stabiliser and then bang, they're, they're now really unstable. Mm. Um, and I think if you really scrutinise the coronal plane film on the MRI, you can often see that actually it's not really attached in the right spot. Um, and I think when we think about the paediatric population, that's the population... Um, So the under 12, like the really young, scalarily immature population, I think they're the ones who may be okay with non-surgical management. Now, that does go against some of the literature which would say that they've got a massive increase in risk of intra-articular meniscus tears, cartilage tears. And I do agree with that, and that's always my concern. But I think in the really young population, it may not heal, but... You've got two groups of kids. You've got copers and non-copers, and you've got and the copers tend to, I would say, almost develop neuromuscularly like your congenital deficient ACL kids. Yeah. So, like, they're fine. They can play sports, and they're, they're most of them have no issues because their muscles have developed to control it. And then you've got the kids who just can't compensate. But I think anything over twelve, the adolescent population, if they're playing sports. They need an ACL. Mm. You know, I think that's the group where your meniscus is going to go next and it might not be repairable when it does. And that's I, 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 I think anxious. it's very funny to hear you say this because I feel like, and not that I brought this up with her, but I feel like Stephanie was very much in the, like, don't get surgery camp. And yeah. in my mind, like, even though I'm a physio, I'm like, I don't know that I agree with this. I don't think that the evidence is there yet. It's not there yet. Right? But, but she was, like, really, yeah. really confident in that. and. I'll wait to see. I'm happy to be completely wrong. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting because you're probably on the other side of that fence saying, like, I don't see it either, yeah. um, or at least not yet. I, I think th- the other thing too is is the differences between the spontaneous healing mm-hmm. where they don't do anything in particular, but then maybe we get different outcomes with, say, like the Tom Cross method, you know, where the they... Cross-brace. The cross-brace, yeah. yeah. But that, that itself, though, I also wonder... Does that bring complications where you're in six weeks of knee flexion? Yeah. I was just about to say, <laughs> yeah. we've got to understand what is the detriment of bracing someone wow. in a flex knee position. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, like if I'm going to non-op a kid and they're young, um, you know, I'm going to let them start rehabbing, get some strength, get some proprioception back. Mm. And then the problem with that is you just got to follow them so closely. Like if they get any... I don't trust my knee, you got to pull them off mm. because that's when they'll get the meniscus tear that's really terrible. Yep. Um, whereas I feel like in the older population, you know, there's 30% of adults that don't need an ACL at all. Like they don't do cutting or pivoting sports. They don't do high-risk activities. Mm. If they just want to lift weights in the gym, then they're going to be okay. Totally. Off them. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, don't even worry about it. So then I'm like, okay, well, who is this um, ACL repair no, sorry, ACL um, healing for what group is ideal? Mm-hmm. And I guess my concern with that is in, a, in an athlete, you put them out for six weeks with their knee flexed and then they fail. 
well, that's six weeks of physio we've lost for prehab. Even if you need to wait that long, they need to then regain their range of motion. Then All those other maladaptations, yeah. I mean, it's not just the knee then too, like the ankle, the hip. Yeah, and I just and that's the thing I can't get my head around. Um, Actually, can I ask you yeah. on that? You brought something up that I think is – sorry, my, my brain No, it's good. <laughs> about waiting to have surgery versus not for something like ACL. Yeah. Um, I've heard different surgeons have different opinions on it. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't seem from my reading that it changes the management too much in either direction. Um, I know people probably have preferences because they get into a sort of a system and a routine that they have made really effective for their mm-hmm. patients. Um, do you have a, a position on that? Are, are you wanting the knee to settle down? Yeah. Are you, or are you, oh, I'm the footballer who wants my knee done seven seconds after I've yeah. ruptured it coming off the MCG? Yeah. I think it's, it's a great question because I think that, you know, there's so many different ways to do this and there's no particular right answer. And I know some of my colleagues have very strong opinions. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I personally like the need to be a little bit quieter, whether that's four or six weeks of bit of prehab. I also just think people bounce back a little better if their muscles are a little bit more conditioned. Um, and if the knee is quiet, particularly with those patients who have a lot of bone bruising, mm. I do think if you've got a lot of bone bruising, then you could drill a bunch of holes in the, in it's the not, bone. It's not going to improve anything. It's not going to make anything more comfortable. Um, and it also proves to a lot of patients who maybe aren't elite, but maybe even high-level athletes but not elite like athletes, um, sort of what kind of stuff they're going to need to be doing. Because ACL rehab is... It's a huge undertaking for patients. Well, I, I feel like one of the interesting things about it, in my mind, like if someone asked me, based on the patients that we deal with, I would say to them, as you said, let it settle a bit, start some, some movement stuff, you know, be in the, get in the pool, walk around, do some of those things and have the knee a lot more comfortable than what it was in the first couple of weeks or whatever it is. Because particularly, even if they're at a high level, mm. this idea and notion that there is a really set timeline for ACLs is a crock. Yeah. Right, it just doesn't exist. <laughs> They're like, oh, you'll be back on this date. It's like, yeah. that never happens. It's so patient specific. Exactly. So, if in my mind, if someone's knee is actually better coming out of the surgery because it's gone in in a much more settled position, I feel like you often catch that up. Yeah. In the in the long run, anyway. Absolutely. And the whole experience is better. Mm-hmm. Right. They have a lot less post surgical pain. Is yeah. something that I've noticed, and even actually a lot less generally post surgical swelling. Um, which can be a real pain in the ass to manage from the physio side of mm-hmm. things when someone's knee just won't settle down yeah. and most of the con- complaints that they have is like, my knee's just enormous and it's hot and it hurts and it's like I'm, I'm feeling restricted. You also wonder how much that influences the healing process too of being in that like of chronic inflammatory state too yeah. if, it's, if it's exacerbated by some underlying bony bruising yeah, or well, whatever it is. Yeah. You know, like we, a good colleague and a friend of ours, Adam Bryant at Melbourne Uni, you know, like he did studies, I don't know when he did them, it was a while back, but on their you know, two-year and five-year follow-ups, they were still, particularly the two-year, they were still finding elevated cytokine activity in the knee following ACL mm. reconstruction. It's like it's two years later. Mm. Yeah. The knee is not happy. Mm. Like, it's not me- you're not meant to do that kind yeah. of damage to your knee if you, if you can get away with not doing it. Well, I think it's also reflective of, too, that remodelling of the ACL yeah. probably goes on for years say. as well. Of course. Too, yeah. And I think we do know it's at least two years yeah. until it finishes the ligamentization process. but Isn't it just 12 months, though? <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing that I think that people don't understand yeah. with that, un- uh, the actual remodelling process, yeah. and like, hence the importance of rehab to yeah. actually apply mechanical load to the graft. Yeah, and also prevent you know, force that we don't want through the graft as yeah. well, like through strength. So I always tell patients, I'm like... The earliest I will ever let anyone go back is nine months after ACL, yeah. and that's provided you meet every single requirement all the way along. And uh, it's really important that you meet meet each step before you move to the next, because this is not about jumping ahead. You know, if you try and run before you're strong, it's just not going to work out. You're going to get pain. You're you going to m- get swelling. You mentioned ligamentization. Yeah. Do you do follow up scans? I don't. Uh, no. You don't. Uh, I, I know don't. some people, some <laughs> surgeons do like doing that. Yeah. I don't. Personally, I don't think it's a good um, use of health resources. Um, I guess my – so I, I use my clinical assessment. You know, if the knee is stable, if it's quiet, you know, no effusion, if the patient's strength is good and they've got no um, subjective, you know, instability, then I, I expect that that, li- that is functioning well. Yeah. And I think um, 
I do have a bit of uh, the health economics in the back of my brain. I, you know, I work across both sectors and I think it's really interesting. There's a lot of, there can be a lot of waste um, in oh, medicine. Yeah. And I think it is important for the longevity of our health system to be mindful of how much you spend. Um, you know, I would prefer to use those MRI scans on my kids that I've fixed cartilage lesions on. Um, to make sure that they've healed because that is a really high risk, <laughs> you know, potentially high risk, high reward, but, you know, a potentially devastating problem if that does not heal. Whereas if your ACL re-tears, you know, you, whether it looked good at two years or not, like what difference yeah. does that make really? So you, d- you wouldn't use it ever in terms of like decision making. Say someone's at 12 months, they've met all the criteria and you're saying like an, an extra thing to actually tick off the sort of list of, you know, capability, you're not going down that path. I guess it probably goes back to the spontaneous healing where if you see healing on MRI, is it the, is a correlational causation here yeah. in that sense too of like maybe for people who do have spontaneous healing, similar to if you have an ACL reconstruction, s- sure it provides some structural stability, it probably has some proprioceptive capacity, but ultimately is the outcome due to all the other rehab stuff that they've done too as yeah. being a, a bigger factor at least. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I do believe the graft will take two years to mature. Mm. I, I, I think that the it's pretty reasonable, the literature that's mm. out there, and I think I, I just think it takes that long. Now, do, do you mention that to patients? I do often. Yeah. You know, and I say that's basically... A, I think it's a really important message. Yeah, and I think, and I say to them, you know, the graft I think is most vulnerable at six months. So I think that's when, and then that's usually when patients are starting to feel good. Yeah. You know, they're like, yep, I could do some agility work. And I do let them do agility work at that point, but I say to them, I'm like, that's when you're going to re-injure because your graft is vulnerable it's often weaker at that time. Um, it's just part of that process. And I said, it actually technically doesn't get better until two years, mm. but I'm not going to keep you out of sport that long. So yep. you need to be strong to compensate for that. With, with that timeline yeah. in mind and thinking of like the timeline to return to sport post ACL reconstruction, is that typically less when you're dealing with an adolescent because of their, they're younger, they're much more adaptable? Or are you still typically similar timeline? It's still it's the same okay. in my hands, nine to 12 months. Why is that? Because you would think based on healing timelines for other things, like, like fractures, for instance, it's not the same. So why is it the same with something like ACL? I, mean, I think it's because we're putting, well, as soon as you take a graft, it's dead, right? And you're asking this dead piece of tissue to turn into a new functional ligament. Um, and I don't think that that accelerates drastically compared to the adult population. Yeah. You know, I think we know that using cadaver tissue in children does not work because it's just not as good quality and it's got a really high rate of re-injury. Um, so we use autologous tissue but at the same time I think there's still a process and we have to respect the process but I do think you know there's certain things that kids get that adults don't get as frequently things like tibial spine fractures I think that's a bit of a funny enigma because it's it's hard to um, so that's a fracture healing problem right it's not an ACL tear per se but they often get stretching of the ACL so that probably affects the proprioception in the limb So I think there's a lot of sort of – there's more of a grey zone around that kind of injury in kids because it's like, well, once their bone's healed, surely they can go back. Um, And I would say that that's typically the case, you know, three to four months, maybe out to six months depending on the kid would be typical for me with a tibial spine versus an ACL reconstruction where I'm asking them to grow a new ligament. Um, Where are we going with ACL? Do you think we ever will get to the point where that healing process is faster? Possibly. Um, but I, I don't think we're anywhere near there yet. Mm. I think there's a few trials that are happening in the US now. There's a, there's a trial about um, ACL healing called the BEAR trial. Yeah, I've seen, I, I've seen some of those research Yeah, papers. I got to go and observe a couple of cases oh, awesome. when I was in Minnesota, um, just visiting, for, mostly for patellofemoral, but ended up uh, getting to observe a few of those as well. It's interesting. It's very finicky. It's a, it's a, it's a technically tricky operation. Um, and I think, again, the jury's still out, but that may be something that we've got in the future um, to get the ACL to heal. Um, it is a surgical procedure, but it's less invasive from a drill hole you know, tunnel point of view. So I think that might be something to watch. Um, but, yeah, at this stage, I think what we've got is decent. I um, mean, you know, it's not perfect mm. <laughs> like anything in surgery. Mm. Um, well, I always think yeah. that like, it's, it's obviously probably a, a, a trillion-dollar kind of industry. If you, can, if you could turn ACLs injuries into a three-month problem, uh, yeah. it's, it's very, very different. Absolutely, yeah. Um, well, I was going to actually, with that in mind, 
Yeah. yeah. One thing that we are seeing is a higher prevalence of ACL ruptures in children and yeah. adolescents. What? <laughs> what do you attribute that to? Well, I mean, like, what what's going on there? Like, what do you think actually needs to be done to address that problem? Yeah. So I think that um, more kids play sport now yeah. than ever before. And I think our, not only that, but our population's increasing as well. So I think those two things go together. Um, I think Australia, generally speaking, we have relatively good weather <laughs> um, You know, throughout the year. Kids can now play sports most of the year, whether that's club and school or a combination of both. And I think, um, you know, we're just active than, more so than we have previously been. Um, and kids seem to be specialising in sports. Yeah, that's, well. I was going to bring someone to ask you because yeah. I, I feel like one of the problems, you mentioned health economics, and, yeah. and one of the things that frankly pisses me off a lot is that parents and kids are over-professionalising, specialising their participation in sport. Mm-hmm. And it means they're like, oh... I strained my hamstring. I need an MRI. It's like you're 14. You don't. Yeah. You don't need the MRI. Like it's. A, it seems very mild on clinical assessment. Yeah. Just wait the four weeks it's going to take for you to heal and go back to footy. Like yeah. you don't need an MRI. Oh, but you know the Collingwood player that I love got an MRI straight away. It's like, well, you're 14. Yeah. It's not. It's not sheep stations at this point. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think that early sports specialisation comes with a whole other battery of problems, yeah. mostly growth-related problems. Um, so I think uh, cartilage lesions, like OCD, for example, that's got a correlation with early sports specialisation. And are you seeing an increase in that in any of the rates, or <sighs> hard to say? It's hard to say at this stage. I mean, I, as you said, I'm, I'm fairly early in my in my career, um, so it's hard to say exactly here in Australia because as a population. It is less frequent, but I do, I mean, just anecdotally, I've seen a number in the last six months, you know, OCDs, and they're always usually young, really active guys, like boys, sort of 12, 10 to 14 age group. Um, and it's typically that's the patient profile is multi-sport athlete or a kid that's been early sort of sport specialisation playing year-round sport and then they also end up with all your classic apophysitis as well like your Osgood Schlatter or your Severs. Severs, yeah. Well, I was just going to say like is part of the issue though too not so much that they're playing lots of sports but it's Monday night they're doing footy training. Tuesday night they're doing soccer, Wednesday night they're back to footy, yeah. Thursday they're doing swimming. It's just more of the fact that every day is something, something. and they're then on the weekend they're playing school footy and club footy and yeah. rep footy. And and I would say it's actually a cumulative thing over the year. So yeah. I often will ask those kids, particularly ones with quite severe Osgood Schlatter or Severs or what have you, and I say, look, do you have any period of time in the year where you don't play anything? And they're like, ah, no. And I was like, is there a time you can think of where there's not a competition or nothing like serious, you know, tryouts? And they go, oh, yeah, I guess like around Christmas time. I said, okay, you need to take the whole month off. Mm. And I'm like, you need to pick a month of the year. I don't care where it is. And just take a month off. Just be a kid. Like, you know. If you're um, going to do sport, just do it for enjoying it as opposed yeah, to the structured yeah. training train, and train, competition. Train. Yeah. And I think it's really a cumulative effect and it's very stressful on the growing body. And then once you get these growth plate related issues, <laughs> it's really hard. Mm. I have to tell them, I'm like, it's not going to go away until you finish growing. You're sitting in front of me as a 12-year-old boy. You're probably going to to keep growing until 16 at least mm. and I'm like look this is going to wax and wane um, and I'm like this is how you need to manage it but again I'm not in the I'm not in the camp of keeping kids out of sport until they finish no, growing. It, it's interesting though like I listened to this really great short book by Michael Lewis um, the guy who wrote uh, Moneyball and it was about his experience with his daughter with like the traveling team uh, yes. circuit in the US and it's become this it's become a big sports economics mm-hmm. You know, thing. It's a really interesting short. I, I had a long drive to Canberra last year, and I, I listened to this on the way. But um, it, it was really interesting because it showed that kids and parents are being taken for a ride for the economic benefit of these people who organise these leagues and these like travelling leagues. And I, I think that similar thing is kind of happening a little bit in Australia. Um, uh, my background's track and field, so. Um, I've, over the years I've worked with a number of schools and the private schools and all that kind of thing and I'm getting the last couple of times that I've done it um, from a coaching perspective I've gotten really frustrated with football particularly um, telling some of the kids that like you know they kind of lead them on because I know that a lot of these the, used to be back when I was playing was the TAC Cup now it's the NAB League 
under 15, under 16, under... And this, there's 90 people they're inviting along because they make them all pay to come and yeah. the kids all want a pair of shorts that says, I'm playing for you know, Oakley Chargers or whoever yeah. it is. And I remember having the exact conversation that you said with a young guy who was at one of the private schools. And it was September, I believe. And I said to him, and I said, uh, he was saying, came in and he was having a chat with him, obviously asked him about some injury. He goes, oh, I've been really sore because we started footy training the other day. I said, like, what? what? <laughs> I said, are you guys still in finals? He said, no, 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 no. Um, we've got this like rep thing coming up. And I said, mate, can football for a bit. Yeah, like, have a break. You're 16. You don't need to be playing football at the moment. And he was like, oh, no, nah, but I'm trying out for this team. And if I make this, like, I, you know, it's going to help my chances of getting dropped. And I said, I actually just said to him, if you're any good, you'll get drafted no matter what. I said, if you need to be playing now, you're probably not good enough to get drafted. <laughs> Harsh. <Right? laughs> it's kind of true, though. Like no, a lot of the, they sell people on this do. dream of like you're going to play AFL, so they string them along and say to them, "Oh, you need to be training twelve months a year for footy mm-hmm. because economically it's good for them, yeah. even at that sort of d- that's development a huge level." Thing in America, yes, yeah, traveling what, teams, yeah, and absolutely. Um, every kid plays extremely high level sport, mm. and I'm like. Not a sporting child. Mm. <laughs> well, again, when you look at statistically, how many of them are actually going to make a professional well, yeah, career exactly. out of it? It's yeah. There's negligible. a different sort of push, though, in the States because of the lack of free tertiary education. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's a very different situation, but I do I agree with you. I think we're sort of with the, the amount of clubs popping up everywhere, you know, soccer, footy, whatever, um, there is a push to be playing sort of something all the time. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. It definitely comes with its own challenges. Um, we, sh- we should probably change tact slightly, if we yeah. ask. Uh, you've obviously mentioned ACL. Are there other surgeries that you find not only unique or the actual say technique you need to use unique to the pediatric population? Um, and is there, is there sort of developments happening in any of those spaces that you're actually finding quite exciting and, and being you know having fun, enjoying being part of that sort of development over time? Yeah, I think um, I would say that there's there's a number of sort of obviously exciting developments. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of things are still very much in their infancy. So mm. probably something that I, I deal with quite a bit of and I'm really quite interested in is the cartilage work. Yeah, um, I so feel like that, 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 that's a really interesting area. <laughs> yeah. It's Particularly because in- there's not good solutions to yes. a that's very why it's interesting. big problem with our way, yeah. Yeah, and I think for me with the peds population, um, my preference is always to save the kid's own cartilage where mm. possible. Mm. And yes, it's not always possible, but I would say it's much more likely that a child will heal even an all cartilage lesion um, than, you know, just taking it out and being done with it. So, like, I've even got a really recent case example where I saw this young kid who'd had a trochlear shear fracture, so pure cartilage lesion, medial trochlear. I see it in, a, in jumping sports usually, but this kid was a skateboarder. Um, I He's think probably jumping. Jumping on the skateboard, <laughs> yeah. But I've seen it in lots of, like, basketball kids as well, um, and it's really interesting. It's not patellofemoral instability, but it must be some degree of overload on the patellofemoral joint while jumping, and it's like this perfect little shear of cartilage off the trochlea. This particular kid came to me at like three weeks and I was like, I really like to get these done before sort of four weeks because the cartilage sits in the in the body, it gets bigger, it gets swollen, it's, you know, potentially going to get crushed. <laughs> he was like, I can feel it moving around. Oh, great. And then he got sick. And from an anaesthetic standpoint, it wasn't safe for us to proceed, so I had to delay him. And then by the time I got to him, it was probably six to seven weeks down the track. And, you know, I was feeling a bit concerned that maybe the cartilage wouldn't be viable. The kid's 13. I'm like, oh. Obviously, it's still very immature skeletally. Um, but luckily, the piece was still intact. Mm. Yes, it was all cartilage. Watch this space. It hasn't healed yet. <laughs> so, but, but you're I, relatively confident. But I'm confident. I got a The quality good, of it was good. It was reasonable quality. I managed, like, the, the bone bed was bleeding nicely. Um, and I fixed that with a an all suture construct that dissolves so I don't have to come back and take anything out um, in that age group Um, so that's just a technique that I learned overseas but some of the guys around Melbourne will be doing it as well Um, but yeah I think you know it's quite 
it's interesting, I still err on the side of saving the cartilage if I can because my alternatives, whilst they're all in development, are not great. No. You know, like, yes, some of them do fine, um, but in a 13-year-old, I think, you know, if I can get his own cartilage to heal, I'm going to take that any day of the week. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, like, thinking of cartilage and degeneration of the cartilage, which manifests as something like osteoarthritis yes. later on in life, do you think we need almost a, quite a radical change with how we deal with some of these chronic conditions that are happening in older populations? Because, you know, whether it's OA, whether it's cardiovascular disease, whether it's um, some type of metabolic dysfunction, they seem to be so much related to environmental factors. And I think of something like cartilage, clearly it's very adaptable in a growing individual. And so, you know, I make it seems plausible to think of it almost like as with osteoporosis with females where building up bone strength and density through a growing skeletal system is going to be much better for having a bigger reserve Mm -hmm. for degradation of the bone system when they're older. Do we think we need to look at cartilage similar where do we actually need to think about a radical change of how we implement strategies to actually maximise cartilage development in kids so that they have a bigger reserve as they get older? I think that's very, I don't know, my, my understanding of that whole facet is it's largely unknown how well okay. we can influence cartilage. I think we know pretty, you know, convincingly how we can influence bone density and what things are good and what things are bad. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think, you know, general things like good nutrition, good sleep for kids, all of that stuff's really important, but at the end of the day I'm not sure how much that actually impacts their articular cartilage thickness because a lot of the cartilage we're talking about and dealing with is epiphyseal cartilage in kids Mm -hmm. um, which you know eventually will turn into bone Um, the problem being in something like an OCD um, where it doesn't but um, you know I like the idea of that but I'm Mm. not sure how much we really understand the best way that we could optimize that because you definitely don't want your cartilage to be too thick like um, you want to have the subchondral bone structure beneath the articular cartilage. Meniscus preservation is really important um, from you know future sort of um, uh, onset of arthritis. Um, but I think what we really need to be mindful of is the way we sort of think about and talk about arthritis and how we manage it. Because I think it's very easy when you've got a patient sitting in front of you who's going, oh, you know, I've had a clean up previously. Just do that for me again, doc. It'll be fine. And I was like, it's not the right solution you know we need to be looking at this more holistically you need to be stronger you need to do low impact activity and it's really hard it's it's hard it's the easier thing to do is go oh yeah sure let's just give it a clean up so just thinking of that like one thing i that um is important for cartilage health is that subchondral subchondral bone because obviously you get a lot of vascularity from the actual bony layer and i know that one of the issues associated with developing cartilage degeneration if that becomes too Mm cortical-like because it essentially restricts the ability for nutrients to go from the trabecular bone to the cartilage. Is that correct? Do you mean in like OCDs and things like that or just just general? general. Um, I mean, there is issues with the – so subchondral bone is of a certain density and Mm. then we do see when the cartilage is unhealthy that the subchondral bone tends to get thicker Mm. or more dense Mm. in response to that. But that's more of a stress and load sort of transfer. Well, I was actually just wondering, like, is there an issue too of potentially too much high-impact stuff through development sends that mechanical signal for the bone to become more dense that actually influences – the ability for nutrients to be delivered to cartilage. Well, that is so. Early sports specialisation, all year round sports participation, even in multi sport athletes at a young age, is a big risk factor for OCD. Mm. Um, and so, essentially, you know, that is combined because of a lack of blood supply. The bone, the epiphyseal cartilage does not ossify. Then you get those lesions. So that is, there is definitely an association there between that problem developing in usually high level athletes. Now, um, the tricky thing there is they're often really good athletes as well. And so then the the consideration is how do you manage this patient? So I actually do tend to be a bit more holistic with my management. So I think they need to be getting good nutrition. You you mentioned that. When you say good nutrition, like what are you looking at in terms of you know, maximising there and, you know, I'm sure you're probably sending it to a dietitian or something like that, but, like, what are the things yeah. that you're actually putting forward in those recommendations? So a couple of things. Um, so I sort of talk to them about diet, you know, within the realms of my 
knowledge on diet. I think, you know, I am no expert, um, but, you know, I just more talk to them about varied diets, multiple food groups, um, you know, it's red flags are picky eaters, obviously. It, does um, that, do you see, an asso- like, even if it's anecdotal, do you see an association between, like, picky eaters and the development of these things, especially if it's in association with early specialisation kind of behaviour? I Probably think- associated with that, like... Not eating enough of certain food groups. Yeah, I think what you're sort of alluding to, I assume, is so I definitely see more stress-related injuries, whether that be OCD, um, apophyseal injuries or stress fractures in kids who underfuel. Um, so like red S, yeah. I guess, is the, the new term because um, it does affect both young girls and boys. Um, so I think it, I, I do tend to talk to them about, you know, mum and dad's or, or mum or dad or one of the parents is usually there and you know, go, okay. And the kid's like, yeah, pretty good. And they're like, no, they only eat potato chips and like chops. And it's like, okay. Is that bad? <laughs> <laughs> Jack. <laughs> um, and I'm like, okay, how about let's talk about green things <laughs> or like anything. And then yeah, I have usually... Some variation. Yeah, and, and, and a, broad, usually, a broad diet. I usually tell the parent, look, if you don't think they're meeting all their requirements, yes, you might benefit from seeing someone in sports nutrition, but also, particularly if they're at a high level, uh, a daily multivitamin, age appropriate, it's not unreasonable. Mm-hmm. And then the other element is vitamin D. I think with the increasing awareness of, you know, sun exposure. Yeah, people aren't getting enough vitamin D No, they're not. Um, and even kids who maybe appear on face value to be perfectly healthy can be vitamin D deficient. And that, I think, does have an on-flow effect on cartilage and the ability of cartilage to heal. Yeah. Well, th- some of the stats of looking at, at nutrient deficiency, even if it's just one within the general population, mm-hmm. it's almost, I think, 100%. Like, and I don't even mean that as an exaggeration. Yeah. Um, it's so prevalent. Are there any particular... Uh, whether it's related to macronutrient, micronutrient, or other particular types of nutrients that are actually quite important that one, is there evidence actually to support taking or consuming certain foods to improve cartilage health, or at least, you know, when you think about it from a um, first principle standpoint, when thinking about the actual makeup of cartilage that you could potentially suggest may help with maintaining or maximising cartilage health? I feel like this is a leading question, Jack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I'm going to be completely honest with you, it's a bit out of my wheelhouse. Yeah, okay. That's where I'd be, you know, talking to one of my colleagues who's a little bit more experienced in that area. Well, I don't want to be putting any words in her mouth, John. He's see. leading you somewhere know, that I, we, I we find interesting. It's we'll, okay. We'll, I, I, we'll explain. All right, so <laughs> we're very interested, and particularly Jack's much more knowledgeable than I am, in nutrition, and we mentioned that study before we got on about, you know, the effect it has on, like, um, you know, genomics and all of those kind of things. But one of the things that we're really interested in, we've spoken about it on the podcast before. I think a couple of times now. Yeah, <laughs> of articular cartilage is mostly made up of type 2 collagen, which is not something that we consume, right, or very rarely. It's only, like, present in a few different types of food you know, materials. Um, and one of the things we've discussed is it seems like with most tissues you need three factors in order to optimise the particularly the, the laying down of more of that tissue. You need nutrition and adequate building blocks in order to support that. You need some sort of mechanical loading that's appropriate to actually stimulate the changes within those cellular tissues. Um, and you need a metabolic and, and systemic environment that's conducive to, you know, you, know, you don't want a hugely inflammatory type environment or whatever it is. And one of the ideas like Jack sort of has looked at a couple of studies looking at type 2 collagen intake and it's so preliminary that like no one has any idea at the moment Mm -hmm. but it's one of the reasons that we don't get any healing generally that we see in cartilage or articular cartilage is because we actually don't consume the building blocks so even if we're loading it and the person is relatively healthy we actually don't have the thing that it requires to actually lay down more of this tissue now we don't have an answer to that and it's completely a you know hypothetical question but we think it's interesting because it's like potentially that leads to somewhere in the future that you can maybe optimise some healing, which well, it's better than none. The, the, the thing I often think of too, um, and I've mentioned this many times, I often look at things like from an evolutionary perspective where it seems problematic that if you, like it would seem that through evolution we would have injured articulate tissue at different times. But you managed to continue to survive mm-hmm. otherwise. Well, maybe they didn't. Maybe they well, just maybe died. They, but then wouldn't the people that survive the ones that have better cartilage tissue then too? Because then you think well, from that evolution. That's true. Yes. So well, unless Julie was there to do their knee surgery. <laughs> <laughs> well, were you there by any chance? Oh, yes. Um, 
No, because, yeah, you think then that, that way the ones with good cartilage would survive. But then I think, well, are there changes in our diet that have led to a higher prevalence? And I think, like, again, it's multifactorial here because we've got to think about changes in physical load. We've got to think about other lifestyle factors that influence the state of our musculoskeletal system. But, you know, gone are the days, too, when we kill an animal and we, we eat the whole thing, which would include eating all the different bits of cartilage or, or dense connective yeah. tissue, yeah. Um, like the very... Um, fibrous parts of the animal as well and is that related to some of the issues that we see I don't have the answer but it's just something that I've, I've considered and yeah sometimes think is that one missing piece of the puzzle yeah look I think it's all very interesting I think that the tricky thing right is as you said we don't have the answers mm. for any of that I would say on on the ground like when I'm doing surgery on a cartilage lesion one of the biggest issues with cartilage is its lack of blood supply as you mentioned it has yeah. to get it from surrounding sources um so I think, you know, and that's the difference between like an adult and a child because a child does have open growth plates. They have a better blood supply to that end of the bone than what we do as adults. So um, a lesion that I'd, he- I'd repair in a child, I wouldn't even think about repairing probably in a lot of adults sure, yeah. um, for that reason. Um, but, yeah, look, I-, I love the idea that there might be something that could help us grow cartilage. Yeah. I think we're... A- some way off. Oh, yeah, <laughs> well, that, that, That's what the question I asked before about like the radical change of thinking about implementing interventions early on mm-hmm. for preventing these conditions. And I say radical because it's so far removed from the, the current narrative. Because yeah. the reality is so much of what we do in medicine, like, so much of what you do in medicine is pharmaceutical management or like yeah. surgical innovation, which clearly have a lot of uh, therapeutic value. But I often think about some of those interventions that might require a little bit more time and organisation. It's not sexy to tell someone to clean up their lifestyle, Jack. It, it isn't. <laughs> but then, you know, I wonder if you need to sh- think about how you sh- restructure the healthcare system to incentivise people to do yeah, that. Yeah, true. Um, hence radical. Yeah. Put the donuts at the end of the treadmill, you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the stick wrapped around the head with the yeah. out in front of them. I think that's been tried before. Yeah. <laughs> On the Simpsons. Um, I, I wanted to ask, in terms of... Uh, we talk about sport a lot as well and I think one of the interesting things about surgery is the skill side of it and the actual, not only you mentioned the physical endurance, but actually the dexterity, the proprioception, the skills associated with what you're doing and manipulating, um, you know, particularly, you know, obviously it's instruments and you guys are doing it guided as well these days. How challenging was that for you and was that part of the interest that you had, that you actually had to develop not only the knowledge, but you actually had to develop a complete physical skill set that is unique and I think very interesting. And I think it's something that separates surgery from so many other parts of professions um, in healthcare. Yeah, look, I, I think it's something that, you know, some people it comes more naturally to than others, obviously, like anything yeah. like sports and things like that. Um, for me, I felt like to a degree I had some you know, natural baseline um, technical skills. Um, did did you have a background in sport or you know, music or anything that had some art? dexterity? Oh, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, so, so I grew up with it. My, my family's non-medical. My mum's an art teacher but also an artist. Um, and so that a lot of that um, influence was pushed on to me early. So we did a lot of like more you know um creative creative endeavors um and i actually thought that i wanted to you know do architecture um i didn't even think that i wanted to do medicine until i was about halfway through high school um and so a lot of my outside of medicine pursuits you tend to be quite um dexterity related um so I think uh i played a bit of sport but it wasn't my my primary focus um but so I think, yeah, it was definitely an, an evolution. And like I mentioned earlier, we're very lucky in Australia to be given the knife early um, in a very controlled environment. Um, sorry, that was probably a little bit you, too crass. You got Jack excited <laughs> when you said get to, to handle a knife. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're very lucky because it allows us to evolve our skill set in a very controlled environment. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't feel like you're being risky to patients because you're very much supervised and you've got a collaborative sort of approach to learning um and yes it comes differently to to some people than others i felt like i did have a good building block to start off with and then yeah it was just a journey getting more confident and well with that yeah (laughs) it's funny because we haven't had someone mention that sort of more creative artistic side do you think that that's something 
that lent you well to surgery? Because one of the things that I've discussed a number of times and we've discussed a number of times with surgeons is we think that there's a certain, it seems to me, and this is an, as an, a complete outsider, but surgeons tend to have a very curious mindset about exploring new things and, and new developments. Now, you do see that in you know the non-surgical medical world, but I feel like there is... It seems to be more constraints, so... Yeah, it seems to be this personality trait. Yeah. Like, we had one surgeon on who was quite older, and it was very funny, because he was saying, early on, they didn't have instruments, right? So he and his mate, who was an engineer, were, were, were making instruments. In the shed, probably. In, in the <laughs> shed, and then, you know, sterilising them and taking them into surgery. And he's laughing, saying, like, you would not get away with no. any of that stuff now. <laughs> But there is that curiosity, there is that inventiveness, there is that want to explore things. And I think that in itself is a very creative pursuit. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that lent to why you were interested in in surgery at all? Yeah, I think it actually lent to why I was interested in orthopedics specifically because I do feel like it's a lot about, you know, putting things back together or, you know, creating something. Um, And, yeah, it was interesting as I went through medical school and then sort of early in my junior days, um, I tried a lot of different things and nothing really clicked. And I think it was because I'm very much a practical, hands-on person. I don't – I hate reading a textbook. Obviously, I've had to do that a lot. (laughs) But it's just not something that comes easily to me. Um, You know, I've got a good memory, so I'm lucky in that way. But I don't have uh, an aptitude for just sitting and reading Mm. a textbook for hours. Um, So as soon as I was able to get on the job and learn on the job, that was like the best thing ever for me. And it just started to come quite easily. Um, So, yeah, I think it definitely lent itself to a surgical practice, um, being more practical um, and creative to a degree as well. Do you have any envy of previous generations that were probably allowed to explore a little bit more and a little bit faster than, you know, before you mentioned, we don't have evidence for that. And I always feel like talking to a lot of, you know, healthcare practitioners, one of the things that actually limits the brightest people is that we have all these constraints around how you do things now. And I'm not saying that anyone should ever do anything silly, but like one of the, the things that I think separates the best practitioners is they, their curiosity to want to get good outcomes for patients and try new things. Yeah. Um, and I do think there is a bit of a culture in um, surgery where, you know, new techniques like, oh, I tried this approach and this seemed to stabilise this better or whatever it is. Do you think that that's something that, um, allows you to kind of you know push that envelope a little bit, or are you still like oh, I need to stay in my lane a little bit? Um, so I guess the first thing you asked me was, do I envy the previous generation? And to agree, yeah, like uh, you know, it, there's some things like you're like, oh, I wish I had that tool. Mm. Um, I've yeah. got that in my shed. Uh, why couldn't I just put it through the sterilizer? Well, no. is, it, is, it, is it going to be the the, the Kirby technique soon? No. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Kirby, the Kirby um, tool. Yeah, yeah the- <laughs> something from my shed. No, I think um, so. To a degree, yes, and then. To a degree, no as well, Mm. because I think we are very privileged now with the advancements in technology to have other ways of learning as well and other ways of what you call experimenting that aren't actually on patients. And so I think, you know, that's where things have evolved. So there's a lot more access now to doing, like, cadaver labs Mm. and having the opportunity to try out new techniques that are tried and tested with other surgeons that have a learning curve for you before you actually even go and do it on a patient. Um, I'm not saying do it on the patient, but that explore on the cadaver even for instance and then no but even then like you do eventually have to do a new technique on a patient right Mm. and the way to do that safely is obviously to practice in other realms and and you know be conscientious about the fact that it might be a different technique i guess for me i'm just trying to get the best possible outcome for my Mm. patient and so i do to some degree change my technique from time to time or evolve my technique is probably more accurate um but never sort of to the degree where I'm trying something grossly experimental. It's more like, oh, I think that I get a better fixation with this construct than this. Why don't I do this instead? So it's not something that's completely foreign. It might yeah, just be something that's... an evolution. That's, yeah, step, a bit yeah. of a change of practice. And I, I really love doing that. Um, and I think we're going to see a big evolution with our junior trainees because they're sort of trying to bring in a lot more virtual reality type mm. stuff as well. Um, Uh, particularly with arthroscopy skills because that's something that just takes time, Mm. right? It's not something, you know, they joke that you're better at it if you're good at video games kind of thing, right? Because it's this weird thing. You're looking on a 
two D screen, but yeah. yeah, and it's all like about facial of what are you looking at right now? Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting, but it that just takes time and practice, and then to be able to then evolve your process, you need to have that baseline first. So I think it will. We are lucky in that sense that I think the next generation of surgeons will have a lot more tools to get better earlier, so then they can start to evolve their practice a bit quicker. Um, I guess. Speaking of which, do you see? The evolution of orthopedic surgery changing rapidly with robotics, like is that is that something that you're constantly having to update your skill set and integrate new forms of technology? Or personally, no, because I'm actually I don't do arthroplasty um, because my demographic is typically younger. I do more joint preserving techniques, so there is some role for like navigation and maybe robotics in like osteotomy work. Um, but as far as ligament reconstruction, we just haven't found a role for it yet. There's a lot of like nuance of anatomic things to do with the patient, um, a lot of navigation, and then the evolution to robot comes from CT data, which, um, you know, for a lot of our soft tissue work, we really need MRI data. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting. I'm, I think it will potentially get there to a degree, but I can't see it ever getting there fully in the soft tissue space. Um, as opposed to arthroplasty, where I know a lot of colleagues are really moving, a lot of people are doing all robotic work now. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that space has moved exceptionally fast. Um, you know, once it got off the ground, it was like, okay, it's everywhere now. Because um, I actually work at the Austin Hospital publicly, and they were the first public hospital to get a Mako robot, which is the Striker mm. robot. Um, which was a huge thing for a public hospital, um, and it's just taken off. And so I do think that space is evolving fast. I just can't see its um, benefit at this stage in the soft tissue space. Um, but I'll watch to see what happens. You know, uh, another question I was interested to ask you is thinking about management of orthopaedic conditions in older populations mm-hmm. versus younger populations. Because, and this is an assumption I make, but if you've got an older person who's got knee OA, maybe they need a knee replacement, maybe do something else, but there's probably an expectation that's going to be ongoing issues potentially. In children, is there, is there an added stress associated with management because I think for the, the child, but probably more so the parents are expecting a good outcome. They obviously don't want their child to go through ongoing problems. Do you feel that there are some extra stresses associated with that population group? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, expectation is such that they're going to get 100% full recovery. Mm -hmm. Um, And whilst that is obviously the goal, it's not always achievable, particularly with some of these more chronic conditions. Um, Or some may just be like we talked about, something that lasts for adolescence and then will get better, but they've still got this four years of what they feel as hell, right, Mm -hmm. like for a waxing and waning problem. But, yeah, I think it really comes down to what we talked about right at the start, and that's communication Mm -hmm. and managing patients' expectations because I I do feel that stress. You know, I've had parents be like, are they going to be 100%? I said, well, that's always my goal. Mm -hmm. I said, but, you know, these are the things we've got to work through to get there. It's not just what I do surgically. It's what you do with rehab as well, and I have to talk through all of that. And, yeah, I guess sometimes I just have to spend that extra 10 or 15 minutes with the family to sort of make sure we're all sitting on the same page. And then that's where my communication style comes into it, that I always follow up with written communication that the patient gets a copy of. You know, it doesn't just go straight to the GP so that they can always go, oh, okay, yeah, we did talk about this. Um, And then they can come back to me and go, what did you mean by this? (laughs) Um, And it's a lot... uh, it's, it's just it makes my job a bit easier mm-hmm. because you're right, it is a stress level because they do expect 100% recovery in every condition. Well, going back to our conversation before, we're talking about risk factors associated with, say, early specialisation, because mm. I imagine you would see, obviously, a lot of the consequences of um, those behaviours or those actions, and a lot of that is obviously led by the parents. Do you, In your experiences, do you see that um, they're, they're open to changing how they actually whether they push their child or not to you know specialize early on or do you find that that's actually can be quite a a difficult thing to overcome well i think it's difficult for two reasons one is sometimes yes you can't the the parent comes to you and their child is going to be the next superstar and you're sitting there going they're probably not and we've all been there right um and you know my role is not to shatter their dreams it's not to tell them i don't think they've got what it takes it's to be like okay well you know let's just think about what is really important here you know the health of 
his knee is, you know, more important than getting back to footy next week. Like, because I, I another case example, I had a kid, you know, really a pretty good footy player, you know, maybe not going to go, you know, AFL, but good, um, you know, and had a meniscus tear that I thought should be repaired. Mm-hmm. 15, 16 year old. They were arming and arming about me. Cut, they wanted me to cut it out so he could just go back to footy. Yeah, and I was wow. like, guys, we've got to talk about this problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've got to have that discussion. And I said, because you might go back to footy, you might get a good. Even if you get good four years, you play till you're like 19 or 20. Yeah, you're 20 years old. Then you've got a trash knee and we're, we're trying to deal with that problem. I said, whereas if we take the time to rehab you now, we might preserve the cartilage and then get you a much longer potential career or you just told me you want to do a manual job. <laughs> like, mm. let's talk about that. Mm. Um, so I think that's one issue is the parents' expectations. And then the other is, unfortunately, by the time they get to me, they've been in, the kid's been in the sport for so long that they can't see life outside of it either. Mm. Um, so it's no longer just the parents' goal. It's often the kid as well. And the coach has been telling them that they're the next big thing mm-hmm. and all their mates and that's what they're known for. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's their identity. And I think, you know, having your sport be your identity is really common. In and, and the pressure too teenagers. at that age, yeah. you know. Oh, like I think huge. that's the other thing too. Yeah. And I think on the flip side, you do see these kids that maybe for whatever reason are not as good as they previously were. Um, And then they start, the parents are still pushing them going, oh, but they were such a good athlete and they're starting to get injured and they're starting to, you know, want to pull back. And that one's a different one. That one Mm. you sort of go, they want an excuse not to, not to play because they're no longer as good as they used to be or as good as everyone was telling them they were. And they feel like they're failing. And it's really quite sad, yeah. <laughs> um, the pressure we put on these young people. Um, but yeah, as I said, my goal is still to get them back to whatever they want to achieve, um, but within reason, I think. You know, another a question we always ask our guests is, are you actually doing anything in particular at the moment that you're learning something new, doing something interesting, which may be related to what you do professionally as a surgeon or maybe related to something that you do outside of your work? Yeah, so my, my new hobby, actually, um, is furniture restoration. I, thought you were, I think you're going to lift up your own go, no. is getting tattooed. No, is, tatt- is, 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 yeah, I'm a tattoo artist. Yes. So uh, it's practicing on myself. Yeah, no, no, I am not, just uh, okay. for disclosure. What, what are you restoring at the moment? Uh, so currently I've got a mid-century bar like uh, made by Chiswell from Sydney, um, like a teak bar that somebody has whitewashed and made it look horrible. Um, so I'm stripping it all back and refinishing it in the traditional style Fantastic. so yeah I'm, I'm really into mid-century both architecture how do you and, find most of this stuff um what's that how do you find like how these pieces find, yeah uh marketplace facebook. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, this one particular one on facebook marketplace um do you like working with tools and fixing things yeah hey? yeah. yeah yeah both professionally <laughs> and personally <laughs> so yeah so that's my current hobby so i'm, mm. I'm learning about that because I've, not, I've never done it before um so yeah i've it's pretty involved isn't it like understanding it's very time consuming yeah, yeah. <laughs> particularly when someone's put white paint on beautiful teak furniture i think the other thing too is then you know you see from what i understand i'm useless in terms of being a handyman but then like going oh, i need to buy this tool yeah i need to buy that tool i need so, to get this so that's where i've been learning is yeah. what's the best tool for each step yeah. um and then how to finish it so that it's also resilient as yeah. well um so i'm very much midway through this project it's got matching bar stools as well so i've got to yeah. like and is this your bar for the pool room at home yeah that's right yeah, yeah. well we don't have a pool room but yeah the equivalent yes <laughs> <laughs> very lovely Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. We really appreciate it. Um, we know it's not easy always to, to find time for these things, so thank you very much. No, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me along.